So if anyone wants to see what I'm up to, it's youtube.com forward slash Tim Michael C H. <laughs> calm down, class. Calm down. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Arts. A R T S. Okay? And that's what you look up, and that'll pop right up. All right. I'm going to hand out evaluation sheets, too. Please fill them out. <gasps> Evaluations of my class. <laughs> this is not going to end well. Um, I'm going to try and turn off the lights real quick just to see how dark this room actually gets. That is far too dark for all of you guys. I'm not. Ah, uh, well, these folks will probably need to see a little bit, too. So, all right, get a ladder. We're going to unscrew some bulbs. I'm just kidding. All right. So, <laughs> uh, yes, it is. Yeah, uh, that is a commission I'm working on for him right now. He just purchased right before the class, and I was going, well, good. Then I'm doing all right so far. Sweet. Let me show you guys a little bit about what I do here. I know we're very limited on time, so I'll just show you my favorite piece that I messed around with uh, just a couple days ago. Uh, I'm just getting into Rubik's Cues. I'm, 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 I'm learning to love them. Um, my brain, I'm not an analytical person, so for me to like playing with Rubik's Cubes is kind of a big deal. Um, let me show you this real quick here, though. This is a time lapse on how this was drawn. You might not be able to see it very well at first, but it will become more clear as, as it happens, especially when we get into the inking. Uh, two things I want to talk about today are going to be, first, firstly, some of the supplies you may want to take if you end up becoming a professional artist or if you want to start off with some good tools. If any of you guys get really excited about this class, I've already told the team uh, here that we might borrow a van and head over to Michael's and you guys can buy your own supplies that I might suggest to you if you feel interested or so inclined. If not, no big deal. But some of the supplies can get a bit expensive. They're like, yeah, we'll be happy to buy all the supplies for them. And I told them, well, one of the markers is eight bucks. OK, let's rethink this whole idea, folks. So yeah, that, that, that idea changed pretty quickly. But uh, we would be happy to take you and get you the right supplies, the right paper, and things like that. Uh, this lovely lady here has got her sketchbook, which is amazing. I have handed out Bristol paper to all of you guys. And the Bristol paper is what we used at Disney. And I guess I forgot to mention that. I worked at Disney for eight years. I was a caricature artist out there. If you ever went to Walt Disney World, uh, I was the guy sitting in the corner making a lot of ruckus and hopefully making people laugh as much as possible. Caricature is not just about drawing someone funny, it's about giving them an experience. When you go to a theme park, you get on a roller coaster, you want to scream a little. You want to feel like you died and came back to life for half a second. Well, when you sit in a caricaturist chair, you don't want that caricaturist just going and, and being boring. You want there to be a little bit of life, a little bit of fun, make them laugh. My favorite thing is, <clears throat> let me see if I can do it. Oh boy, a little bit of experience working at Disney. <laughs> so. It got, it got a laugh, and, and, and if you're working with little kids, there's a certain comedy there and everything. I've always wanted to be a stand-up comedian, and I did not realize that working in the world of caricature was going to take me there by accident. I always said I'm a, a stand-up sitting comedian, though, because you sit when you draw. That's a terrible joke. Okay, so what we're going to do instead is I'm going to show you some of the supplies that I use when I'm out at the parks when I was working at Disney. I've now moved to Great Falls, Montana. That's what happens when you get married. Things go kind of crazy. So um, when I'm out at the theme park doing stuff like that, one of the first things I have with me, and this is a sales pitch. Um, where did I put it? Did I leave it at my booth? I bet you I did. If I did, I'm going to have you guys stop by the booth and check it out later. Nope, I got it. This right here is a uh, mechanical pencil. Now, you guys have your mechanical pencils there, but this one's a little different. This one holds a two millimeter lead. Uh, if you do uh, caricatures at Universal or at SeaWorld in Orlando, uh, they draw a certain kind of caricature. It uses a pencil with a very large lead, and then they airbrush the caricature, which is super cool. Uh, if you work at Disney, we use markers like these guys, Prismacolor uh, or chart packs, uh, and then we watercolor our caricature. So depending on the kind of way you might lean, that's something you might like doing. Another thing that I do, believe it or not, is some of you guys might know about these Pentel refillable um, uh, bodies. So you can put water in here. Works amazing with watercolor. Um, and I literally have a little watercolor thing uh, like this guy right here. And literally with the water that's in here, I can do a whole bunch of work using my paints. And these are all dry paints. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but what I've done is I found a specific ink that I really like, and I filled this with that ink. And this will last me weeks of drawing every single day. 
Uh, now, here's the thing that you might find. I'm throwing a lot at you. Swallow it and then come find me over at my booth and we can chat as much as you want. Um, I'm, I'm here every day for teaching every night uh, for five days and then I'm out there drawing caricatures. Would love for you guys to come out and buy one. And uh, you're in the class, I'll give you a discount, but shh, don't tell anyone. It's already a discount as it is, so, but I'll hook you up. Um, Sharpies, you all might be thinking Sharpies are a good idea for doing caricature, fat chance. And the, reason, and the reason why is the nibs are absolutely abysmal on these. One of the most important things about caricature is line quality. If I make a new canvas here on my screen, uh, let's do this, 17 by 11, and I take my little pen. This is an um, Apple iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil. One of the things that really makes a caricature sell is line quality, from thick to thin, whatever you can do. A line that doesn't have this line quality makes your artwork look very bland. Having form and shape in line is a key thing. So let me see what pen I was using. Total pen. So like a fill pen here. This is some one I have. You can see the difference in line weight from one point to another where it almost just completely disappears. You need to try and create that same effect with one of these. Whether you're doing it with a pencil, and with a pencil you're going to draw a line, and then you're going to start scraping out the line to fill out the shape. Whether you're doing it with a brush pen, which means... Brush pens kind of stink if you have a heavy hand, and I'll explain what a heavy hand is in a second. Brush pen, you're thinking, you're painting with it. The more you push the br bristle down, the more thicker line it creates and vice versa. Uh, and then with the Prismacolor, that has a brush pen on one side, which is very nice, a brush, brush nib. And then with a chart pack, that is, it's called an ad marker. That's a fine tip chart pack. What I'm going to do, and I don't have many of these, so take a few moments to pass these around on your Bristol paper. I'll start with you, sir. And try each marker and try to just create a thick to thin line. Try it once or twice and then pass it on. Now the difference that you're going to feel, the chart pack, you're going to have to push pretty hard. You're going to have to put down a bit of pressure for the chart pack marker to make a line variation. Uh, for the other one, for the, um, uh, the what am I saying here, the uh, Prismacolor, that one is going to make a quick line variation much quicker without pressure. So if you are a person who spends a lot of your, you, know, you see I got him right there, I saw that face right there. Um, to, for, if you're a person who when you write your name or when you're writing notes, when you're in church writing your notes or whatever, if you have a heavy hand on your pen or your pencil, uh, usually that happens because you're using um, uh, like a rollerball pen or something like that, you might prefer the chart pack as an option. And then just pass it along, pass it to the table behind, vice versa. You got paper too? Good. Uh, if you are a person who you like having light, lilty kind of a feel, uh, and you feel like you don't push that hard, or if you have art experience and you sketch with a pencil first before you start inking things in or whatever, uh, you may find that a, a brush pen might be more your style. When I got into caricature at Disney, uh, we started with um, Marquettes, which aren't even sold anymore. I would love to tell you to get a Marquette, but they don't sell them anymore um, and because their only market was caricaturists, and that's a very small market. And then, and, then the other, and then the other option was the chart packs, so most of us went to chart pack. Um, the other nice thing about chart packs as well is if they run out of ink at a certain point in time, you can te technically refill them. If you go to a, a Home Depot or Lowe's, you can buy a pipe cutter. And a pipe cutter is like a piece of, uh, it's a metal bracket with a knife on one side. You can put it on there, tighten it on one side, and then literally cut off the end of the chart pack. A couple drops of alcohol restores it, and you can get a little bit more life out of it. It's pretty sweet. And when you're a caricaturist on a budget, yeah, boy. So that's, that, that's a problem that you're going to find pretty often if you are an artist, uh, especially if you draw at Disney. I'll, here's, I'll let you inside. Uh, if you guys have ever seen caricature artists, it sounds pretty awesome, right? Sounds like the cool job. It is. It really is. I'm going to teach you how to look at people funny, and it's a wonderful thing. I don't mean, I don't mean giving them a look. I mean you're going to learn how to see them funny, and it's a beautiful world that we live in when you're able to see the beauty, the fun, the entertainment inside of each person that's in front of you, even when they're yelling at you for hitting them in the car. The not suggested idea. The smile makes it really awkward. So my, my suggestion is... Loosen up here. This class is going to be about thinking loose. Forget a couple things. Allow me to reinvent your mind. 
Um, anyone say, I can't draw, I don't know how to draw, I'll never be able to draw like that, anything like that? No, so I got a bunch of, fairly so. So here's, here's my argument, and I love saying this argument. This is the one that I use all the time. It's kind of like my father and his bad puns that he keeps pulling out of the box that he used 600 times in one day. Um, brush your teeth in the morning. Which hand is your dominant hand, right or left? Okay. Have you ever hurt your hand, decided to try and brush your teeth, or do anything with your opposite hand? It is miserable. You're like, ah, I got this just fine. And you're here and you're like, ah, oh, no, wait, no, turn the brush. Ah, ah, you know, you're fighting with it. Why is that? Your non-dominant hand isn't stupid. It's because your brain is not communicating with your hand. You've trained one hand to do a very precise movement, very precise stuff. Your other hand is junk. And, I'll, and, and here's the thing. I'm a professional artist. I've been doing it for years, right? And I'm, I can draw at Disney and I can make a big fuss. If I draw a straight line with my right hand, trust me, that's actually a straight line. <laughs> Left hand. I don't have the micro control to create that same line. And that's because I haven't taken the time to train this hand. So this one goes behind my back and everything's done with the dominant hand. So in the same way, your brain simply is not trained to work with your hand in the world of art. That's as simple as it is. Your brain just has to learn to communicate with your hand. Once you've made that communication, that connection, things start to work a lot better. But that takes a couple of years of practice. That's as simple as it is. It just takes years of practice. And so when everyone comes up to me at Disney and they're going, oh, I wish I could draw like that, well, when's the last time you tried? <whistles> they're gone. OK. Uh, Oh, I, I, uh, were you born with this talent? Sure. I came out of my mom immediately drawing her face when I came out. No, that's not going to happen. There's time, practice, and training involved. So you can be a creative, and you can draw semi-decently, and you can become good. But you know what? There are so many analytical artists that are amazing at caricature because analyticals can see math on a face. They can do the math on someone's face and parse out how much adjustment needs to be done to make a caricature an exaggeration of form. So what I want to do is I want to start you from the beginning here. I've shown you some of the supplies you might want to have. I forgot to mention these two, so we'll go ahead and get these out of the way. Um, when I walked into Disney and they, they hired me to come on and draw, I was actually contracted out there uh, with some really amazing artists. I didn't realize that I had to learn watercolor, and I had no experience with watercolor. Well, I did. It's a cute little kid's play set things, you know, and you always use far too much water. It makes a mess. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you ever want to use watercolor ever? No. And they, this is what Disney's doing for professional stuff? Thanks, guys. Make it easy on me. So when I walk in there and I start figuring this stuff out, they say, so you don't need watercolor? <laughs> no. And so I was figuring they'd fire me. They're like, all right, we're throwing you to the wolves. Hang on a second, folks. This is not what I want to deal with. So what we do is we take different paints, all watercolor paints. You can get them pretty much anywhere. Get them in the tube. Take an empty um, case, squeeze them in there, and let them dry. They will crack. They may chip out. They may cause trouble over time. Try to keep them a little wet, but I haven't used this in, okay, three years. I literally have not used this in three years, and yet these pa paints are going to be the same ones I use all night uh, tonight and for the next week, and they're going to be just fine. Not a problem at all. They, um, I can suggest a couple different brands, but truth be told, all brands will work just fine for caricature, and because it is watercolor, they will dull over time. You don't, you don't have a choice in that matter. They will dull over time. So go buy yourself a really cheap set. Um, the only thing I suggest you invest a little bit more in is a certain color called Van Gogh. Van Gogh um, is the brand, and the color is orange. I will look it up, and I will tell you to, uh, tomorrow if you come back. But uh, there, now, now I got you interested. Yeah, we'll get you on the paint color. No. Um, I'll have to look it up, but it's, a, it's an orange uh, specific color, and it's literally skin tone. The less you can mix, the better off you're going to be. So you're going to have all of your primaries. You're going to have a couple secondary tones, like some uh, yellow ochre. You're going to have some, uh, some brown, uh, burnt umber, per se. Uh, and then that orange uh, skin tone uh, from Van Gogh is excellent. And you're going to be using a lot of that, so buy a couple tubes, okay? Uh, if you choose to go watercolor. Um, later on this week, um, I'm going to bring in my whole art supply kit here. I'm going to set it up. You can all stand around, and I will do a live caricature in front of you guys. It's basically the same thing I'm doing out there. So if you get bored, just come watch me out there, too. That'll be the same thing. But you can ask questions, and I can demonstrate some stuff. 
And then uh, the last course, I'm going to be drawing a digital caricature here on my tablet, and uh, you'll be able to see that whole thing here on the screen as well. What am I going to teach you in the next 30, 40 minutes or so? I'm going to try and show you the actual human proportion of the face. So every person, the reason why they are a caricature is because their face is unproportioned, whether it's non-symmetrical or asymmetrical, or whether because it's not meeting um, the golden, oh, the golden rule, if you will. So uh, if if you ever see celebrities, uh, there's a reason that they're celebrities; they're idiots. Um, the other the other reason may be because they have a very specific kind of face. I'm actually going to draw on this. This is a good idea. I'm smart. Um, I'm sorry. So when it comes to a face and someone who find you you might find someone attractive, it may be because within that face, everything, and I'm going to move out of the way for everyone who can't see over here, everything, you're welcome, everything is going to be perfectly symmetrical from one side of the face to the other. It'll all match up across the board, okay? Um, now, that's a very small part of our population, not quite what we're looking for here. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to first off show you how to mess up a whiteboard, and then I'm going to show you how that's going to work in proportion of the human face us, how we might find separation. Uh, how many of you have looked in the mirror and found something off balance in your face? Okay, and then you felt that for the rest of eternity because you hate yourself for it. Okay, here's, here's, here's the thing, that's not something you need to be worried about. If, have any of you ever gotten drawn by a caricature artist before? Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, oh, perfect, thank you. Um, one of the things you may have found by being drawn by a caricature artist is, uh, how many of you felt judged? in the same time, okay? Uh, no caricature artist is out there to judge you. There are two different kinds of caricature artists, and I learned this uh, at Disney. Um, there's the caricature artist who likes to uh, distort, and distort is a, a term that we try not to use in caricature because distortion isn't a true form of caricature. To distort, you're just taking this here and this here and this here. It's basically, uh, uh, what, what artist am I thinking of who puts an eyeball up here? Picasso. Um, that's distortion. We're not an extortion. We don't extort. We, <laughs> we exaggerate. So we push things, we pull things, we tug things, and, but they stay in proportion to everything else as much as humanly possible. And you're going to learn a little bit about that uh, tomorrow. Let's go ahead here and get rid of this. And let me start uh, with a basic circle just to kick things off, okay? Um, if you work in an iPad, I love Procreate. Procreate and another one, if you want to learn a little bit more about them, just ask me questions. Uh, can everyone see that circle okay? Are we seen it clear? Um, all right, now this is also, we're going to play Simon Says per se. You are welcome to follow along because these are your notes. Um, and just to let you guys know, uh, this, this says tips accepted but not expected. That's when I'm out there. But here's the thing. The way I make money from you guys is by selling you class notes. I may having you make your own. If you're enjoying them, give me a tip or something like that, I'm good. You get what I'm saying? Good, I think we agree. So, and if not, who cares? I don't mind. I got flown out here to do this. I'm from Montana. I'm happy to get away. We're good, okay? All right, so now here's how we begin the basic proportion of the face. All right, we're just going to go ahead and start by drawing a circle, okay? All right, and, and your circle will stink just as badly as mine is. The reason why there's so many rings in my circles, and, and literally I will spend 20, 30 seconds doing this in circle and circle and circle, and then what I will do is I will pick one that I think is a line, and that will be my final circle. That's called cheating, but it works. There's nothing wrong with cheating a little bit. So once you have your general theory of that circle, go ahead and take it and cut it in half, okay? So we've cut our circle in half, now we're doing so far so good. Now, just below, you're going to choose this, you're going to make your own decisions, and you're going to find an, an, another method that isn't going to match this. I'll use this method and then I'll use 600 others. There's no rule to art, okay? I'm just giving you a theory. Pick an area just above the bottom of that and make another line down here, okay? That's going to set where your nose is going to go. That other line is going to set where your eyebrows are going to go. Okay. Now, continuing down, pick one more area, but you want to use the top line and the bottom line. Come down that exact same distance 
So if I take my pencil right here and I put it here, that's very close. If I take it and I put it down here, my next line needs to be down here. Does that make sense? So, so wherever that is, then that's where you're going to go ahead and go for the bottom. That is going to be your chin. Okay. So we've already created a couple different features here. It works pretty well. You might remember this from your school books. You're welcome. This is back to preschool. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the bottom shape, that bottom sure. square, bless you, and you're going to draw two lines here and here. And you should see that they should roughly have the same amount of space in between there. You see what I'm saying? All right, now if you, if you have a, a, a bit of a um, creative mind, you might actually kind of see a face in that already. You might already see the place where the nose will go, the mouth and the, the, uh, the lower chin there and the bottom of the chin, even the neck, depending on how you design. So now let's go ahead and do this. You're going to make an oval, and, and I'll do the whole thing, and then I'll show you why this is important. You'll make an oval right here. We're going to make what looks like a cyclops, but you need to make that oval the same size so that you can make two more the same size on each side. Okay, so that's five ovals across. Go ahead and do that. And do that right below your eyebrow line. And you don't have to be perfect. No, no, one, no one's judging you here for whatever size you go. Now, if you want anime, make those suckers real big. <laughs> You'll see why in a second here. All right, we all good? All right. So what you've just done is you've placed your two eyes in a perfect perspective, in a perfect proportion face. These eyes, this one here, and this one here are where your eyes are going to go, okay? Right now it looks kind of weird, but yeah, that is where your eyes are going to go. I'm going to back up here so they kind of disappear and go back to the normal one. All right, now let's take a look at our nose. We know where we put our nose line, so make like a little arrow pointing down right now, right here. And I want you to take the nostrils and, and the, the edge of the arrow, take it out until it meets this part of the circle. Remember, these are your notes. So whatever notes you need to make uh, to help you remember this, go ahead and do that. Okay? If you want to come in, you can, man. Don't worry about it. And if you got a scoot, it's okay. There's some paper right here. There's a couple pencils there. We're just chilling out. No big deal. It's not like I'm filming this for YouTube or anything. Hi, YouTube. Totally kidding. But I'm not. All right, so now you've got the basic idea for the nose. What you can do now is your mouth here. What you're going to do is you're going to imagine, well, just go ahead and do this. I want you to put an eyeball or iris right here. By the way, this guy looks really freaky when we're done with him, so just expect this to happen. Uh, put, uh, put eyeballs looking straight forward at us right in the middle of those two circles, okay? If he looks like he's doing a dead stare, then you've done it exactly right. Now, draw a line from those eyeballs coming down to your mouth line, okay? Coming straight down to your mouth line, just like that. Okay, so your mouth line is that one right here just below, okay? All right, we're doing great here. Way to go. All right, now from here, we've already placed where our nose is, we've placed where our mouth is, we've placed where our eyes are, now let's place where the eye eyebrows are. The eyebrows go on or above that eyebrow line, so if you want to, you can draw them above, just like this. Now this is going to be incredibly generic. All of these features are different for every person you will ever meet, but this is where they technically should be placed if you were a perfect human and uh, uh, wonderful Heil Hitler had his way. And that is a joke. And it's a very bad joke, but it is a joke. Okay, so now we've created this whole form here. Let's go ahead now and move down from here. Right here, what this bottom line is right there, that line is going to be the top of our chin, like right here. All right? So now let's go ahead and just whatever you choose to do, however you choose to do it, take a line from the side of the face and create whatever type of chin you want. From the side of that eye on the corner, 
down and create whatever kind of chin you want. Doesn't have to be perfect. Doesn't have to be pretty. Just give you that, just give you that basic flow. Okay? This circle now, right here, if we were to draw a line that kind of connects to the circle, I'm kind of over on this side of the screen right now, um, and I'll try to make it a little bit darker. This right here can, can be, become a form of cheekbone and can work its way down to the chin now. So kind of like this, and, and this, is, this is, it's going to be different for everyone, but you can get a basic idea of how that chin structure might work out. All of us have a muzzle, believe it or not. We have a muzzle that starts here and comes underneath our chin. And that muzzle, if you were to pull it out, next thing you know, you're a dog or a cat or whatever, that shape right there coming out. But we all have it, and it's created by our laugh lines, it's created by age, the age lines that come off the sides of our, our lips on the sides and curl under our chin. So you get that basic form. But we all have that, and what you can do now is if you were to go ahead and draw uh, draw an arrow per se, like draw an actual arrow, kind of like this. Okay, so we've gotten like an official arrow pointing down at the mouth. Now you can create that muzzle shape by coming off the areas of that and just come around the side of the mouth to start beginning shaping that muzzle. Okay. Now, right at your eyebrows, if you, if you take your glasses off, if you want to, it's up to you, you can put your fingers here on the sides of your eyebrow, and you'll feel a structure right off the eyebrow that connects. And you'll, that's actually the, the bone structure of the, eye, of the eye socket, okay? That eye socket there works its way all the way around. But you can technically kind of just start going up, your, up to here, and you might not feel something, but that line moving up this way is a ball in itself. There's a sphere right there in your forehead. And so what you can do, if you want, is you can create that sphere in your forehead right here. And we all have it. And it's an important thing to note because a lot of shading takes place there. Uh, if you have a lot of sun on your face, whenever you see a guy like me when I was bald, um, that uh, there's a lot of glow that goes on there, that's all I'm saying. And uh, that's a very key place because that also helps you build the furrow in your eyes. That helps if you, you can, that helps you tell if someone's eyes are more sunken into their head or if it's pulled out more based on how far out that forehead comes, okay? So right now this looks like a really miserable chicken scratch, but believe it or not, that's your class notes for today on the very basic formula of what you can expect. Now, here's the things that are going to adjust as we look at the idea of caricature. I'm going to make a new layer here. I'm going to select a different color. And let me show you what can happen now as we start to look at things. This is where we're going to start to see forms of exaggeration. I'm going to start with the nose, and hopefully the red will show up okay. Uh, nose can be exaggerated in this area here, okay? This can either be very, very thin or very, very wide. And, and based on that shapement here from very thin to very wide, that's going to choose how far in or how far out your eyes are going to be. If you choose to do a very thin line in or make a very small bridge here, then your eyes are going to come closer together. Everything that you choose to do is going to stretch and contort something else. I can't just take this guy and give him a big nose. When I give him a big nose, that's obviously going to change the shape of his muzzle. It's going to change the shape of uh, his mouth. It's going to change the shape of everything. So if I just change one piece on his face, it's not going to look like him anymore. So what I have to do is I have to move everything in proportion to everything else. And with the lines that I've shown you here, when you cho choose to stretch one line, you can see what it's going to do to the other ones. Um, a, a way that I was taught by one of my mentors, Keelan Parham, uh, he had a book that he released. Uh, he was the uh, main owner that, uh, was con that contracted us, us, us artists at Disney. And the thing that he had is uh, the idea of a balloon. If you drew this face on a balloon, and you took the balloon and you stretched the balloon, that face, everything would change on that face, not just the nose, not just an eye, not just a nose, you know, everything would stretch and contort with it. And if he took it and he stretched it up, 
the same thing would happen that way too. Now there's a, tomorrow I'm going to show you a couple little things that can happen when you choose, and we might actually have some time today, I'm not sure. Yeah, can you keep an eye on time for me? I, I, yeah. Thank you very much. I talk way too long, and when I get going, I don't stop because I am one of those narcissistic people. I'm sorry. And, uh, but what I want to show you is how some of these things work. And some of these things work kind of like a pulley system. You ever seen how a pulley works? You got a rope that goes through a pulley. You pull on that rope, and it pulls whatever up with it or down with it. Well, that same thing happens when you're adjusting the face, and I'm going to show you that. All right, I usually don't like water, but that tastes really good. <clears throat> okay, so any questions that you guys have so far? I throw a lot at you, and go for it. So you kind of mentioned your classes later on in the week. Are all of your classes the cumulative? I mean, they are. Like 101, next is 102. Next exactly. Week, okay. And if you can't make it for it, it's okay. I say go check, take a look at the YouTube channel, and a lot of this is on there as well. Nice thing is you get to ask me questions here and, and learn a little bit more, and I am very available to answer any questions over at my booth as well. So, but a lot of this stuff that I'm teaching is also available on my channel. So you'll, you'll find everything you need to know there free of charge. So, um, but yeah, for, for tomorrow's class, we're going to talk a lot more about exaggeration and proportion, uh, but actually finding the areas to twist and pull and have fun. Uh, the next day following that, we'll be doing some more demonstrations on um, how that works in real life on paper. Uh, I'll sit down with you guys, and we're going to do drawings together. I'll bring in a, a face, and we'll pop it up here, and we'll mess around. And by the end of the week, I would like you guys to try and draw each other because, well, and here's the thing. All of you guys are not going to be judging each other because all of you guys feel like you suck. Aww. So you're going to be doing just fine. So none of you are going to be putting each other down. The only thing you can do is laugh with each other and not at each other. So it's, it's something that will be very helpful, and, and it's a room where it's a no judgment factor for anybody. And I want you guys to feel like you can enjoy yourselves. If you did really well, I'd take you out onto the floor with me and see how you do with everyone else. But we'll, we'll get there at uh, day five and see how, how well you have fared. Um, Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the other things that can happen here. The distance right here between the eyebrow and the eye can compress as well by a lot. Okay, um, And then the nose, obviously, a very wonderful place to exaggerate is right here between the eye and the nose. Now, if you exaggerate between that eye and that nose, usually there's a cheekbone here. And we have to consider our shapes. So if you have this circle shape here, like this, what's going to happen is that's going to compress. It's kind of like an egg, okay? But you need to think about the laugh lines that might be going on under the eye. Let me draw an eye for you over here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sketch out, and let me change my color here real quick, just so we have a, a rough idea. So the eye's going to pop over in that top left corner over there. When you draw an eye, there's, and, and this is really cutting into my lesson for tomorrow, uh, but we'll call it bonus. So we'll go ahead and draw the basic form of an eye. You are welcome to follow along if you want. Um, the eye is not the shape that you remember from school. It's not this. It's not this weird thing going on here where it's exact across and there's a line here and there's a line here. There's a lot more structure that's going on in the eye. Because if you think about it, behind the eye lid, you have an eye ball. Okay, are we seeing that pretty clear there? All right, cool. Uh, and then on that eye ball, you have an iris, okay, and a pupil. And all of that plays a role, but I'm not looking at you guys all day like this, okay? If I did, you wouldn't be in my class because this is frightening. That is the extent frightening. It's scary. If I'm making this face, something's wrong. That's why when you look at every kid's artwork that they've ever drawn when they were age five and below, all those people that look like they're so happy holding mommy's and daddy's hand look like they're being abused. It's a little different than what they intended because everyone looks frightened. So what we need to remember is that the eyelid closes over the eye and will close over that iris a little bit. And if you're wearing makeup, it does it much different. Look at how quickly I can make this freaked out eye suddenly look very, very calm with just a couple changes of my line work. Now that looks kind of soothing, doesn't it? It looks a little bit calmer. There's not a lot of you know, going on there. Now it looks almost like they're looking at you with some kind of love, you know? There's, there's more attention to that here. So when we're looking at this eye, 
you need to consider uh, several different features here. When I said that the cheekbone over here, when the cheek here, this egg starts to be pushed up because you've pushed up on the nose, now what you're doing is, you're, how many of you will admit to having bags under your eyes? I think, I think it's fair that most of us, if not all of us, have bags under our eyes one way or another, whether it's due to age, lack of sleep because it's <laughs> FCM, whatever the case may be, uh, we have bags under our eyes. Those bags will gather more and more and more based on how much you're squishing something up. So if you're drawing someone and you go, I want to take their nose and smash it up into their face, which is totally okay. That's not as mean and terrible as it sounds. Uh, you're going to do the same thing with the bags under the eyes. And you may have to overlap one over the other. So instead of this circle being all the way down here and then the bag under the eye sitting just above it, you may find that that bag under the eye is now coming on top of, the, uh, on top of that bag and is causing a change in the eye. Here's the thing, smile. You felt your cheeks rise, didn't you? You're squinting a little bit more, aren't you? All right, well, the reason you're squinting is because that's all pushed up. Gravity is doing its thing, and, and all that te technology in your face is doing the same thing. So when you want to you wanna, you wanna look at a smile, I can draw anyone with a sad face, and I make one change in this eye. And even with a sad face, I can make them look like they're smiling. Can you make a guess? I'm going to put you on the spot and make one of you answer. Can you make a guess what one thing I would change in this eye to make someone smile? Yes. Make squint more? Precisely. But there's one specific place I would squint. Precisely. Uh, we, in, in, the, in the photography world, in all that stuff, we call it the squinch. It's, that, it's the raise of the bottom eyelid. And what you're doing is you're, not, you're, you're creating a concave shape and you're making it convex or vice versa. I'm, you'll see here in a sec. If I erase the bottom of this eye, and instead of coming down, I push it up. Did it all click just now? Did you all feel that click just there? Either they're screaming on a roller coaster, or, or there's a big smile, or someone just asked her to marry him, or whatever. That is a sign of happiness. I can't make that look other than anything else other than happiness. That will always look that way on any face, period. And that is a super important tool in caricature. When you've got someone sitting in front of you who's tired, exhausted, or you want to hear this, how about a baby who's asleep in a chair, and yet their parent still wants a caricature of them? That has happened to me. Their parent thought they were being helpful, stood there, and held their eyes open. <laughs> That's not going to help me, but if I, can, if I can at least see the eye color, I can fake an eye. And I'm going to teach you my Disney, Disney princess eyes tomorrow. It's my own patented technique. <laughs> um, and the, even though I use Disney, it's patent pending. Um, so the idea of this, if I don't know the real shape of your eye, I can fake you something that will get away with it just fine. And as we go through the next couple days, you're going to find that some of the features I'm going to use are going to be the same. Uh, that is a button nose right here on you in the purple shirt. You have another form of a button nose, but it's slightly different, OK? You have another form of a button nose, but there's a small difference in there as well with the nostrils. You definitely have a button nose. That is clear as day on your face, sir. And, and so I can go and I can pinpoint, and I can use the exact same drawing from your nose, from your nose, from your nose, and from your nose, and I can still make you all look like, each other, like yourselves. Even though, I'm using the, uh, even though I'm using the same shape, slightly different. So I want to teach you guys a couple basic shapes. And tomorrow we're going to be talking a lot about 3D shapes. And those 3D shapes can be used to create caricature. Believe it or not, I have watched caricature artists at Universal use the exact same face on everyone in line. I, I used to, when I first was really getting into caricature, I bought a year pass to Universal specifically, not to ride rides, but specifically to watch caricatures for hours. I became that guy who didn't buy a caricature, but he was sure standing around a lot. And uh, they were very cool with me, and they gave me tips and tricks, and they noticed my interest. And the thing is, there was this one guy, this one, uh, this one guy, old. Every time anyone sat down, he would draw the same chin. He would draw the same everything. But then he'd make little quirky changes. Suddenly, it turned into them. 
putting the best caricature in the world. But when you're a caricature artist, it's not always about the caricature. Sometimes it's about the money. When I worked at Disney, and here's like once again, here's the truth. I would drive um, 40 miles each way from my home to Disney. I'd pay seven dollars in tolls each way, not including gas. And so now I would be sitting there waiting for people to come up to my booth. They wouldn't always come up. I would have days where I would draw literally zero in a five-hour shift. Uh, I get paid per sale, and for Disney, I get paid one third of the sale, thirty percent. And that changes as you work longer in the, in the company. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention one thing. I know I'm jumping off here. I'm going to pass out these markers as well. OK? And here's, here's something to try. Um, take out any marker you want. Crayola markers have really amazing nibs, OK? They're perfect for hard-handed caricaturists. So a black marker in a Crayola pack is actually really helpful and something you might want to do. Empty all the ink out of it and refill it with another ink. No joke, works amazing. And the nibs are fantastic and they're cheap markers. So when it comes down to it, you don't always have the, the opportunity to put time into someone's face because we're trying to get through five, six, seven, ten people in line. And sometimes you just have to make do with what you make do. So that's the truth about caricature. It's not always as wonderful and invigorating as it sounds if you have 10 people waiting in line and you have three hours to finish your day before you have to close up shop. So at a certain point in time, you go to the basics. You draw whatever you can. You're pushing it out fast. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about shapes. We're going to talk about how we begin to see uh, different types of shapes. I might pull a couple of you up here and, and put you on the spot. But please know, my wife hates my guts because she thinks I'm judging her 24-7, 365, because I'm a caricature artist. I look at you, you have a long face. Sir, you have a slightly square face on the top, but it comes down to a point a little bit here. Let's see what you got. All right, rounded, but small uh, chin here. I can make that a fun dimple chin right here, where I can pump, pump down a little bit. You also, a lot less forehead, a lot more lower face. Can be fun to exaggerate, be known as a pear shape. My wife thinks I'm doing that to everyone, and I am. But what you feel so bad about for yourself, I think, is a sign of beauty. And you can have the caricaturist who chooses to exaggerate that in an ugly form, which some people like those caricatures, or some people, like me, want to take the feature that you find is beautiful about yourself, the smile, the lips, the nose, for sure. You can definitely have fun with your eyes, because you have a lot of structure in there that can be done with them. And I can push a great smile out of you, for sure, in a heartbeat. And that, that right there, that, that half smile right there is cute, too. And by the time all is said and done, I can find a personality in each one of you guys. And I can make it pop one way or another. And I want to do it in such a way where by the time we're done, I've drawn something beautiful of you, not something ugly of you. You go to Universal, you go to uh, SeaWorld, they're there to mess you up. You know, if you do a smile and you find you have a lot of gum line, if, some, if any of you guys have smaller teeth but larger gums, yeah, they, they take that and they turn you into, into Don Quixote, you know. And some people love that, though. And, but you need to understand who you might be walking in front of. And so the best thing to do is to study a couple caricaturists, see how they draw before you sit down with them and get drawn. And that can just be taking five minutes to see what they're doing first and go, you know what, I'm going to wait for this guy over here, you know, or whatever. It's your choice to become the artist that you want to be. There's nothing wrong with either side of that. There's just a different market for each one of you, you know. And if you're just doing it for fun, drawing your family, or you just want to learn how to draw faces better or whatever, this is going to be really fun for you because I'm going to show you the overall exaggeration of it, of what you can do to it. And then you can just condense it down and you can draw some beautiful faces. And the first thing I studied when I was a kid was eyes. I loved drawing eyes. I loved drawing eyes because you all have absolutely gorgeous eyelashes. And if you don't think you have gorgeous eyelashes, you all have awesome makeup. And the makeup it's is mascara. mascara. It's amazing. <laughs> you realize that I'm stuck with this. Everyone says, you have such gorgeous eyelashes. I'm like, thank you. And they're like, you, is it mascara? Come on, no. You know? And, and it's not that, you know, I'm stuck with this. But each one of you guys has something special about your eye. Your eye is so much different than each one of you. And if I can take that and exaggerate that and exaggerate your eyelashes and then show that, I love color around your eye. I love, I love shadow eye. When did you hear that from a guy last? 
unless he's talking like this. Oh my gosh, I love to do my shadow, you know. That's not what's going on here. For me, I love that because you ladies who put on your makeup in the morning do not realize how amazing you are as artists. You, you are absolutely stunning at, at being an artist because you've learned how to con, uh, uh, contour. Thank you, contour. You've learned how to create these forms on your own face to change the weight of your face, the shape of your face. You've learned all that. You ever seen these Asian girls on YouTube who, who put tape all over their face and, and they, they show the unraveling of their face and they're a completely different person altogether? Well, that whole, that whole situation, you are an artist. And I've learned, I've learned how to apply makeup purposefully so I could do that better in caricature. No joke, uh, for Halloween I played the Mad Hatter, and if you know the Mad Hatter from the newer movies, uh, he's makeup crazy. I did the black and white version, and, and I, I put on my own makeup. I won first place in my wife's contest at her hospital where she worked. And there was a humongous furry standing next to me. And if you don't know what a furry is, it's a person who puts on a full head-to-toe mascot costume, and they're awesome looking, but I won even though that thing was standing right next to me because of the work I did on my face. You know, they freaked out about that. You girls can do that in a heartbeat. What I did was nothing compared to what you girls can do to take something that could go so wrong and blend it all and make it something awesome. Take those theories, that lesson that you did to your own face, apply it to caricature, and then add some exaggeration, and you got something absolutely amazing. And that is what I'm going to teach you in the next couple days, okay? How am I doing here? I got about 10 minutes. Oh, okay, great, great. So, uh, ask me some questions. Do you have any questions? Have you ever seen RuPaul's Drag Race? Oh, no, I haven't. I'm okay with skipping. Uh, that, that they like invented, uh, like, so facial contouring for women's makeup, it actually came from that, that, didn't it? Yeah. And their YouTube tutorial is for like three to four hour makeup. Wow. But it is ridiculous. And those are the people who can make, like, take the makeup and, like, like I can make myself look like Johnny Depp. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Contouring to change, like, the shape of your nose. Yeah. Or, or even the, the appearance of the size of your nose. It's ridiculous. And you want to know the, th the funny thing is I, in drawing caricatures at Disney, I get a lot of people who come up with face makeup on. Yeah. You know, they get face painted, and then they come to me and they want a caricature. <laughs> there's a pretty serious problem there. That's so funny. A different color on your face means that there's a different proportion showing there. Yeah. So w makeup is fine. Makeup is perfectly fine, but a, uh, a face painted face you're going to be fighting a little bit to figure that out. I'm trying to see if we can wake this up here. Uh, you know, I thought when you described the muscle that it actually helps face paint. It does. You know, you know that's why you want to be fine. Yeah, that. absolutely. That is, that's a, come on now, behave with me here. That is a very, that is a very key area. Yeah, and, and are, there, are there like diagrams for face painting about where that specific area is? So it's a dot method. Oh, okay, example, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're doing your dots here, and then that's how you make the wings and stuff. Yeah, that would make sense. Using the landmarks of the face yeah. to create that sort of thing. Right, that makes sense. So, I mean, if I got 10 minutes, let's, let's just have some fun here, and let's just kind of push into the next lesson a little bit. And please come in with questions. I love answering questions. Uh, if, you ever, if you ever have any questions, please text me on my YouTube. Uh -huh. you also show the body. That, that's what scares me is giving somebody a body after you've got the head. Body scares me to death, too. No joke. And yet, that's the best seller at Disney. Yeah. So I'm going to show you the cheap way to get away with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing. Yeah. At Disney, they do. At Disney, that's a big thing. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about on the last day is creating your own booklet. And your booklet is a series of templates that you have memorized in your head that you can draw in a minute. If someone says, give me a, give me a random sport right now. Soccer. <laughs> okay, so random soccer. I'm going to go ahead and draw a head here. Here's the top part of my body. Here's a leg coming out like this. Okay, this is a leg coming out here with uh, something on the foot. And I know it's very unclear here. Uh, and I can draw this right here. And let's go ahead and put some eyes on this, do do do, and have them freaking out like ah, you know, like crazy like that. Um, and then right over here, what we'll do is we'll put a um, a fence, 
uh, you know, like a goal here. Okay, and then in the back, let's call this the paper right here. In the back, right back over here, we're going to do this like kind of circular thing here and here. And this is going to be stands. Here's some clouds like this. Okay, right there is a template that I've had memorized my, uh, in my whole career that I use every single time someone says they want to be drawn playing soccer. And the same theory is with baseball, with football, with any sport, period. I, I, I have a very, when someone says fishing, <laughs> that's one of my favorite ones, because the template that I use for drawing fishing is Usually you do one fishing like someone like pulling on a fishing reel or whatever. Mine that I templated for myself is that the fish is about to eat the boat and the guy's pulling on the fish and the boat fish is pulling into the boat. And so, and actually I might have that here. I might have that here. And I might actually have a couple templates. Let me see if I actually have some actual templates here. I'm pretty sure I do. Yeah, here we go. These are a few templates that I use with my designs. Right here is my basketball template. Whenever I draw a basketball, this is the one I'm going to use. Okay, um, let me jump out of here, see if it'll let me. Uh, here's my football template. Here's something important to note. Not touching the ground. There's always action. If they're not touching the ground, that means they're in action. It's a nifty thing to do. So if you can take a moving character and take them off the ground, it's going to help out a lot. Any of you guys know Uncle Bean? Maybe not, but I drew him holding up a balloon that he blew up, not on the ground. Action as much as possible can be done without standing on something. By the way, here you go. So what you do is you create a booklet that you have on your stand. People can look through them, pick their favorite, and you draw what that template is. Because you've done that template hundreds of times, quite literally, I've drawn over 5,000 caricatures while I worked at Disney, and then some. I can draw these so much faster than I can draw a custom piece. And believe me, when you tell them that you can draw a custom piece, their brain goes ballistic. I had a girl who decided that she wanted to be playing piano and basketball and tap dancing all at the same time. I made it happen, but it took a while, and it was hilarious. But the thing is, if you can inspire them to look at your book and draw something a little quicker, because they picked from your template that you already have memorized. You know exactly how you're going to get there from part one to part two. It's going to save you a world of time. And they're still so much fun to draw. They don't get old. Because as you're talking with them and you find out something funny about them, and she's always on her phone. OK, well, let's augment what we had. If, if she's always on her phone, why not take one of the arms on her, move it up, put a phone in her hand, like an iPhone which is just drawing her hand and a square. And then you can hide most of the hand behind the phone. So if you're like me and you hate drawing hands, there's a way to fix that. You know, why do you not see any hands in that picture? You want to make a guess why? Um, and uh, you know, if you have to do something a bit more custom, you can still keep it simple. But you, you're, it's going to take you longer to create these things. So template it. Learn a couple templates. So yeah, my, this is actually my boss. Uh, I, I'm a radio DJ in Great Falls, Montana. And uh, he's our boss. And he just bought a camper. And he bought two of these uh, fun things here. And I was like, all right, I'm going to make them like rot, rock while, Rottweilers or something like that. And he has them on a leash. So it's his generators. So that, that's just a couple concepts of what you can do. And then if you drew, do stuff from home, like I do a lot of stuff for clients um, for business from home in digital right here on my iPad or on my computer. Uh, this guy's a photographer. I took one of his pictures, and I drew him standing in his own picture. How, how much do you think he loved that? And that really did not take that long, because all I did was drew him, took his picture, I blurred it slightly so it looks like it's in the background, and threw it behind him. I'm done. I made 70 bucks off of that. You know, so there's 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 ways to make some quick money from this if you enjoy the hob if you enjoy the hobby. There's nothing wrong with that. I did a series of um, interviews with a uh, 20 different guests on a podcast that I do on StarRadioDigital.com. It's my podcast show that I do for our radio station. I interviewed each one of these people, and I did a drawing of each one of them, and they're in the intro of it. Three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, this is kind of funny. Uh, this is how we all feel in Montana, if you haven't seen this one. Uh, this one got over 20,000 views within one day because we were dealing with some really stupid weather in Montana. 
when, my, when summer was supposed to be in Montana, it was still snowing in my town. We had it happen here a couple times. Yeah. yeah it's like ridiculous. Late, like yeah. Like it's spring. <laughs> so we, th this was something fun that I threw together, and I didn't realize it went viral. I'm like, okay, finally a viral one. I was kind of expecting it to be a YouTube video, but okay. So, but yeah, I got tons of stuff like this. And um, like I said, if you guys have any questions at all, feel free to ask. I've, I've been doing this forever. So, because um, you were talking about products and stuff at the beginning, and you mentioned mm -hmm. the, like, airbrush versus watercolors. Yeah. Have you seen where it's colored pencils? Oh, yeah. You color it first, and then you add the water? Yeah, I've seen that. Um, would, that would that be good, or no? Or? I, try, I tried that for a little bit. Honestly, it takes more time, believe it or not. Okay. Uh, I it, try them. I just know right. they exist. Well, and here's the thing. When I started working at Disney, I bought a really, really tiny brush because I thought I was going to need to, you know, it's going to take a lot of time to do stuff. This is a 3 fourths inch brush, and a lot of artists at Disney use a 1 inch brush. Oh. Even for the detail areas, they're using this. Wow. And, and the thing is, if you, if you are in a rush to get stuff done, you can actually do a lot with this, because I can use just the tip of this to get into the corner areas and things like that. So believe it or not, this is an all-purpose brush. And if you come and check out some of my caricatures that I draw that I will hopefully sell, praying on that one. So uh, that, that one, uh, I will be utilizing this brush for everything because it is the quickest way to get from point A to point B. So a detail brush means you're going to spend more time applying paint when you need to be spending more time applying the paint and then putting it where you want it to go. So using, using a pencil, scraping it down, and then using a brush believe it or not, will probably take you more time than it will just to take this brush, get that color down, move on to the next part. So, so if you're a control freak, maybe the control would be better. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, trust me, I'm a control freak, too. I, oh, very much. I don't coloring and watercolor, so maybe I'm just too scared coloring, of watercolor. And I was, too. This is called being forced to train. When you, get, when you get sick and you go home and you're laying in bed, you're exhausted, you're annoyed, but at the same time you're sitting there going, well, I guess this is forced rest, I may as well deal with it. When you walk into a scenario like at Disney where they say, okay, you're going to have to learn caricature and do watercolor, you're sitting there going, force training, okay. So it's one of those things where you just got to force yourself to try it. And when they say your only option is to use this brush, okay, I guess there's a way to do it, and you just figure it out. That's, that's the, the thing. Put yourself in a forced scenario to figure it out, and you'll get somewhere.